Okay, so today we are talking more about sampling. And the first thing we're going to talk about is systematic random sampling. So what this is, is where you sample, pe sample people based on a pattern. So for example, if I wanted to get your guys' opinion, but I didn't want to survey all of you, I could ask every like third person who comes in the door. That's a systematic random sample. So. Everyone done copying this down? to know, guys, a librarian wants to know the mean number of pages in all of the books in the library. The library has 20,000 books arranged by type, so fiction, bibliography, and so on, in shelves that hold about 50 books each. So how could we do a simple random survey of 500 books? Huh? What's a simple random survey? Huh? Okay. What do I need to do before I put it into my calculator? How do I know where the numbers are going? What am I going to have to do with every single book? Okay. I have to give every single book a number. Okay, so after I number the book, then I can either use a random number generator or I can use a table like we did in the warm up earlier to select the 500 books. And remember, when I'm picking my numbers here, I don't want any repeated. So the 500 books need to happen without repetition.
<laughs> so we spend the rest of the class here doing. <laughs> Turn the page with all the books. <laughs> we actually take a field trip to the library. This is actually just to see if you're willing to do it. Alright, guys. Okay, so you've already told me you don't like this method. Uh, what could we do? How could we do it if we did it as a strip? Stratified random sample of 500 books. Um, Cass, are you using yeah. your hand or stretching? Um, you okay. <laughs> Which, would you say? Genre. So, like, pick them by genres? Each row. So we just, like, walk across the library. And, like, <laughs> Okay, why would choosing it based on genre be better than, well, like, why would being genre be a good choice? Okay, so, are you telling me that different genres might be different? Yeah. Why? Yeah, so like nonfiction is probably going to be longer than like a children's book. Right? So. Mm -hmm. Every Friday. It's like that at like every high school. Was that? It was like that one. I have school spirit. Okay, so I assume since a lot of people are talking, you're done writing? Okay, so C, how could I do it as a cluster sample? So how could I break these into clusters of books? Yep. So I could use the, no, <laughs> not rows. <laughs> Okay, so when I'm using the bookshelves, how am I going to choose a fair spread of data? Huh? <laughs> no. Remember, when I do clusters, I have to use every single book in the bookshelf. Yes, I will need to count the bookshelves. I have to use the full bookshelf. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to number each bookshelf. Hold on. 
going to trust my math. Huh? I was right. <laughs> so I'm going to number each shelf 1 to 400 because 20,000 divided by 50 means there's 400 shelves in the library. That actually feels really small for bookshelves. Yeah, like if you think of like the city library. Um, mm -hmm. So then I'll still use an, then I'll still use a random number generator. And this time we're going to pick 10 shelves because 10 shelves is 500 books. Okay, so there's one last question I need to answer for C. Why would I pick this method over, say, A? Yeah. So it's easier to number 1 through 400? Okay, <laughs> so D wants me to say D wants me to say what's wrong with each of my methods. So let's start off with the first one. What's wrong with SRS? Okay, so I don't know what's going on with that C. Okay, what's wrong with the stratified random sample? What? I 
Okay. So the stratified might not match up to how many each book rec actually represents in the library. Okay. Presence, right? It did. My handwriting just looks weird. Okay, and then what's wrong with clusters? Think about in a library how the books are set up in a bookshelf. Alphabetically, how? By author. So if I'm doing cluster sampling, what am I getting a lot of in each shelf? Yeah, so. So, yeah, but if like, let's say I was someone who writes a lot of books, and, okay, J.K. Rowling, there's like a ton of books by her, I'm going to pick all of those giant books, because they're all like 600 pages each, right? Yeah. And so that's going to... It could mess things up if other authors don't write nearly as long. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, anyone still need this page up? Okay. Uh, first definition is under coverage. What does that sound like? Okay. So the data doesn't cover everyone, right?
So if we think back to the survey I gave you at the beginning of the school year where I just asked information about you and I got your guys' like, um, opinions about the school year, um, I could say that that survey was under coverage because who am I missing in this study? Well, obviously everyone else, but specifically who's not represented in this class? Freshmen and sophomores. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so all I have is 16 and 17 year olds, seniors and juniors, right? So, in fact, picking any of my classes will result in under coverage because I have no freshmen. Yes. He's a senior. Not anymore. He switched to pre-calculus. Okay, so So you guys done writing? So what do you think non-response is? So in that survey I gave you guys, one person in this class didn't respond. The they're the non-response. <laughs> and this happens when someone has already been chosen to participate in the survey. So I can't say that it's non-response that like someone in my first hour didn't respond because they weren't chosen. So they have to be chosen and then choose not to answer. So the next thing I have is response bias, and this occurs when there's a systematic pattern of inaccurate answers to a survey question. So for some reason or another, the person answering my question is giving me a bad answer. So for example, if I was asking you guys to keep a journal of your feelings, and I'm like track it over a week and you didn't want me to think you were really down, you would lie and be like, ah, oh, every day I'm super great. Like that could be a response bias. Another example of this is if I asked you guys how often you have an alcoholic drink every night, you should all say none because you're under 21. And that would be an example of response bias because you feel like you don't want me to report you, so you're going to say none even though you might drink. Hopefully none of you do though. But like something where like you don't want someone to have a negative opinion of you, you could lie about. Good choice. Water's always good. Orange juice or apple juice? 
really don't like either. Grape juice? Cranberry juice. Grape juice? Yeah, I don't know who likes grape juice, but like... Cranberry juice is pretty good. Grapefruit juice. So grapefruit juice is probably good. Like, they put sugar on it. Never mess with grape juice. Okay, so we're done writing down response bias. Yes. Uh, sampling frame is a list of all of the individuals in the population. <laughs> so for sampling frames, these usually don't exist. So think if I wanted to survey, if I wanted to survey the, everyone in the U.S., is there a list of everyone alive in the U.S. right now? Social security numbers. Everyone alive right now, including someone who was just born like two minutes ago. Okay, <laughs> so going back to under coverage. What kind of problems would under coverage cause? So for, okay. Yeah, so if I was making decisions based off of juniors and seniors in my class, I definitely would be missing out on freshmen and seniors. So if my question was like, what do you do for lunch? And all of you are like, oh, we go out for lunch. I might assume freshmen and sophomores also go out for lunch. Are you sure they don't? <laughs> I've definitely worked at a high school before. I know they sneak out. Hmm? I don't think I have a favorite class yet, but I definitely like teaching this class because of the subject, not the people. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All my other classes are college algebra. Okay, guys. What problems? What problems could non-response cause? Okay, so I might not get a good enough sample size. What else? Okay. Okay. So it's not voluntary response. It's actually different. We'll talk about that in. Yeah. <laughs> She's just laying at that hand. Every day she's been dropping subs. Just so you can say that. 
Okay, so how is non-response different than voluntary response? How are people chosen for voluntary response? No. So think of voluntary response as like a survey on a news website. Well, is the news website picking the people to respond? No. So in voluntary response, people are self-selecting. In non-response, you've already been chosen and you're choosing not to respond. Okay, and then the final question on this question, how can I reduce non-response? So I'll go back to the survey I had at the beginning of the semester. How could I ensure that everyone responds? What could have I done? Make it a grade. So if I incentivize it, you get something for doing my survey, that'll increase people to do it. It depends on how I'm doing it. Like if I've already chosen you and I'm paying you, that's not necessarily bias. If I'm paying you and you're choosing yourself, then that's bias. Okay. So what problems might response bias cause? <laughs> oh yeah, bias. <laughs> yep.
still need this up? Okay, so my first definition is sampling vari variability. So what this is, is if I do different random samples, they might give me different outcomes. So like if I pick Example, there's 19 of you in this class. If I sample 19 of you, you might answer differently than if I go across the hall and sample 19 students over there. So. Oh. Okay, so my next one is inference. This is using information from a sample to draw conclusions about a population. So I asked you guys how many hours of work you, hours of work you, how do I want to phrase this? How many hours you work each week? That's how I want to phrase it. A lot of you said none. So inference would be me going, oh, nobody in this school works because nobody in my class works. Most of you are having Okay, the next one is margin of error. This is how far we expect an estimate to be from the truth. So typically you'll see this on surveys where they publish the result and they'll be like plus or minus 0.3%. It's telling you it thinks it varies about 3% either direction. Okay, the next one is statistically significant. This is when I observe results and it's too overwhelming or um, unusual to be explained by chance alone. So for example, let's say I survey everyone except for the people in this room and they all tell me they get like seven hours of sleep. Then because there's like such a small population that I didn't actually survey, my 
um, sample would be statistically significant. Okay, so what do you think the benefit of increasing the sample size is? Okay. So I'm going to avoid using the word accurate because the only way I can be accurate is to actually ask everyone. So there's increased precision. and it reduces the margin of error. 